On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we discuss the decline of the U.S. Merchant Marine. I am your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to What's Going On With Shipping, and I hope you enjoy the new view. Uh, I was able to install my new camera, thanks to all my Patreon supporters. I appreciate everybody who supports us at Patreon, and this is the type of thing that I can use that improves the quality of the show. So thank you all uh, for contributing to the show and supporting the show throughout its run. It's been fantastic. And again, if you can, please do support us via Patreon. We'll have our listing of that in the show notes and at the end of the video. So today, what I wanted to do was take a minute and discuss the decline of the U.S. Merchant Marine. Ran a video earlier this week on the announcement of the U.S. Virgin Islands registry being opened. And it raised a lot of concern about why are we doing that? Why is there a Virgin Island registry being opened? What's wrong with the U.S. registry? And let me be clear, I am a huge supporter of the U.S. Merchant Marine. Even though my name was on the document that was talking about the Virgin Islands, that does not diminish or change my view that we should have a U.S. Merchant Marine. However, the history and the facts behind the Merchant Marine since the end of World War II indicate that it is on a downward trajectory. And unfortunately, it's going to take a lot to prevent that from continuing on. And I'm not writing it off by any means. However, I think it's important, too, to look at the history of it. This history is going to be a summation. It's obviously not going to include everything since the end of World War II. That would be a really long video. What I want to do is just hit on some of the major points and really emphasize what I think were key moments and reasons why the Merchant Marine begins to decline. So at the end of World War II, the United States emerged with the largest merchant marine in it. It had been number two going into the Second World War, and because of reductions in the British merchant marine and because of a massive shipbuilding program undertaken by the United States, it emerged with the number one. This is a result of the Merchant Marine Act of 1936, along with emergency provisions that resulted in the construction of ships like the Liberty ships, the Victory ships as depicted right here, and T-2 tankers. By the end of the war, the U.S. had a merchant fleet that made up 63% of the world's fleet, which was amazing. It's actually the largest percentage ever in the history of modern steam steel shipping that we ever seen, eclipsed the most the British ever had. However, within a very few short years, by 1948, that number had fallen to 36%. And one of the reasons was a series of programs the U.S. initiated right at the end of World War II. We could have maintained our dominance if we wanted to, much like the British did throughout the 18-1900s, for example. But instead, we passed two laws that immediately put us in competition with the rest of the world. One was the Ship Sales Act of 1946, which basically sold off excess vessels. We had over 1,100 ships were sold to repopulate merchant marines of not just our allies, but also our enemies in, in World War II. We gave ships to the Japanese, to the Germans, to the Italians, along with the British, the French, the Soviets, to re-equip their merchant marines so that they would not be dependent on us. We were in a very commanding position. We could have remained in a very commanding position, but we didn't. The other aspect was the Marshall Plan of 1948, which basically spread out among the world this idea of, you know, we're going to provide in low cost interest loans to you to rebuild your infrastructure. And one of those areas where infrastructure needed to be built was in shipyards. Shipyards had been decimated during World War II. Even in countries that were not occupied had suffered greatly in their shipyards. And one of the big things we saw that happen was the prefabrication that was done in American shipyards, the, the massive construction of Liberty ships, that was exported overseas, literally entire shipyards that were closed in the United States because we went back to traditional shipbuilding methods. The prefabrication yards were disassembled, packed up, and shipped overseas in some cases, and used by nations that were our allies to rebuild their shipbuilding infrastructure. So right from the very beginning, as soon as you get out of the 40s, the United States finds itself in a position where it is not in the lead anymore, and we open up this competition. In the 1950s, the U.S. decides to reorganize its government shipping office. 
We previously had the Maritime Commission that had been in place. Uh, it had superseded what was initially the U.S. Shipping Board. But in 1950, they decided to recreate it into what is known as the Maritime Administration. The Maritime Administration created in 1950 was a joining of two elements. It had in it the Maritime Administration itself, which oversaw shipbuilding and the operation and maintenance of the Merchant Marine. It also had within it the what was called the Federal Maritime Bureau. And the Federal Maritime Bureau was kind of the administrative element of it that dealt with international shipping. And so within the Maritime Administration, you had the old Maritime Commission, basically, and the Federal Maritime Bureau. And understand, this position was a pretty high up position. It was actually an assistant secretary spot in the Department of Commerce. So the head of this was, you know, reported only to the Secretary of Commerce and was in charge of policymaking when it came to shipping. Now, in 1961, that's going to fundamentally change. You're going to reduce the level of the maritime administrator. It's eventually going to be transferred out of commerce over to transportation. And then you hack off of it the Federal Maritime Commission. And the Federal Maritime Commission then becomes an independent board that deals with international shipping. The other element you have going on here has to do with labor and the issue with labor. And, and labor is, is one of these key issues that has been resonating throughout the history of the U.S. Merchant Marine. Go back to early part of the 20th century, the La Follette Siemens Act of 1915. Uh, Robert La Follette, a senator from Wisconsin, progressive, passed a Siemens Act that was really the, the Magna Carta for Siemens rights. Prior to 1915, when sailors would, would sign on board, mariners would sign on board for international voyages, they were basically signing their life away into the hands of ships, masters, and companies. Well, that changed under the La Follette Siemens Act, and that was later codified into the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, the Jones Act, when everyone tells you the Jones Act is just coastal shipping. They're wrong. They don't understand the Jones Act. Siemens rights were a critical issue. And one of the things that we see is the creation of unions and very strong unions when it comes to the maritime sector. And one of the most telling issues of this was in 1934 on the West Coast, a series of strikes by longshoremen, stevedores, and shipping personnel that basically crashed the West Coast ports. We're in the midst of seeing whether ILWU, the longshoremen union out on the West Coast in 2022, is going to renegotiate their contract so that we have a contract in place when it expires in June of 2022. This contract was, was absolutely crucial because it opened the door for the growth and power of the unions. They were successful under the National Re Labor Relations Board and acts passed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The unions were given a lot of power. And unfortunately, in the history of the Merchant Marine, maritime unions are essential for ensuring rights. That's great. It's exactly what you want. The problem is there's too many of the maritime unions. There are unions that represent ships on the East and West Coast. There are unions that represent the deck officers. There's unions that represent the engineers. There's unions that represent the unlicensed personnel. There's unions that represent the officers. And oh, by the way, there's multiple unions that do all those things and they compete against each other and they still exist today. It is a problem when you have to operate a ship and deal with multiple unions, not one union, but multiple unions at the same time. And that's a condition we find the merchant marine in today, this issue of unions and the role of unions in shipping. So U.S. comes out of the 1950s and 60s with a substantial merchant marine, and it's still one of the top 10 operating in the world. But what you're starting to see in the 50s and 60s is the emergence of competition. Uh, nations that are heavily subsidizing their merchant marines, giving their merchant marines a lot of incentives to operate Greece, Norway, Japan, for example. But you also start seeing the what's called open registries. These new registries start coming in. And in truth, the United States is one of the leading causes of this. In the years leading up to World War II, we were operating under very strict neutrality laws. We were not allowed to trade with nations that were in a state of war. This stems back to World War I, 
the issue about not allowing U.S. ships to get us into war as it happened in 1917. So to support the British, <coughs> excuse me, in their war against the Nazis, the U.S. decided to basically haul goods, especially aviation fuel and, and gasoline, on Panamanian flagged tankers. FDR worked with the heads of ESSO, was Monday Exxon, to basically register some of their vessels when it had previously been under Danzig flagged, shift them over to Panamanian registry. And now with Panamanian registry, they can sail across to England during the state of war. They don't violate any of the issues regarding neutrality acts. They would have largely American crews, but with some Panamanians on board. Well, after World War II, it was found by many companies like, well, this is a good deal. We can keep the ships registered in Panama. We don't have to go through registration with the Americans. We don't have to pay the high cost corporation taxes. And oh, by the way, we can actually hire non-American crews to operate them. And so the Panamanian registry emerges as a new registry, a, a registry that very quickly starts to gain support. Add to it in the beginning of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union began to look for allies around the world. And one of the places we wanted to get a foothold in was in Africa. Now, early 1940s, uh, 1950s, late 1940s, there's very few independent nation states. Africa is carved up among European nations. But there is one nation state that's free and independent that's aligned with the United States, and that is Liberia. And a former Secretary of State, uh, Edward Stinettis, while stopping at Liberia on a trip, realized that they need to do something to keep Liberia active in the American sphere, but generate revenue because the country was really poor and needed something. And so Stinettis had this idea for a Liberian registry, and they create the Liberian registry in the late 1940s and the 1950s. So by 50s and 60s, you're seeing, again, these emergence of these open registries. You're seeing the growth of these rival merchant marines. And the US merchant marine has kind of begun a slow kind of descent. And we see that happen. And so there's several efforts to revitalize the merchant marine. And they, they take kind of a, a couple of different forms here, as we'll talk about. So one of them is, is of course, the use of technology, of technology. And so in the 1960s and the 1970s, we see the use of new types of container move or, or cargo movement, and particularly containerization. Now, the U.S. has always been an innovator in marine technology, whether it's propulsion, cargo, you name it. But one of the things that the United States can hold credit for was the creation of containerization. Malcolm McLean comes up with the idea of the container in 1956, the SS Ideal X sails from Newark, New Jersey to Houston, Texas with the first 58 shipping containers on. That becomes what's known as Sealand. And Sealand, owned by Malcolm McLean, wanted to always stay in the forefront of technology. Now, he had a hard time selling containerization. In the late 50s, early 60s, it was a lot of problems. Uh, there was a resistance against adopting containerization because you needed a lot of shoreside support, cranes, yards, trucks, chassis. You need a lot to deal with the containers. We today take it for granted, although we're seeing the issue with the lack of containers and, and cranes and chassis today because we've maxed out the system. Back then, you had to invest in that. And he was having a hard time selling. I got to say, uh, it, it was a real difficult time. His proof of concept came in Vietnam. And he made a contract with the U.S. government to provide container or surface to Vietnam. In November of 1965, there were over 100 ships waiting to offload in Vietnam. And these are old, break bulk, kind of palletized cargo. It takes a lot of individual moves. He comes in with 11 vessels and clears the backlog and shows how effective it is. And he doesn't just deliver the cargoes to Cameron and Da Nang but he has set up a intermodal transport service where they offload the containers and transport them inland to depots where they then hand them over. They're using these 35 foot containers. Now that's the impetus that Sealand needs. And Malcolm McLean is rolling in the dough with Sealand at this point. And he decides to invest in a new technology. He builds these ships on the left, the SL sevens. Doesn't build them in the United States. He builds them overseas in the Netherlands and Germany. He doesn't want to build in U.S. yards because U.S. yards are expensive. 
He can get a subsidy to do it, but he doesn't want the subsidy because the subsidy comes with too many strings in his opinion. It restricts his it, where service he can go. He'd much rather operate without the, 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 the subsidies. These ships were designed for ultra high speed, 33 knots, extremely high speed. Uh, the ships were unique in their design, but they didn't carry a lot of containers, carried a little bit over a thousand containers. You'll see up forward, she doesn't carry any containers at all. She carries them between the, the forward house and the engine room and then on her stern and several below. Not huge container ship by the, by the measurement of today. They were extremely fast, 33 knots. They burned six barrels, barrels, not gallons, barrels of fuel a mile which was fine in the early 1970s, but then the OPEC oil crisis hits and gas prices through the roof. And these ships became a pariah to, SL, to Sealand. They couldn't operate them. They slowed them down to operate them, but then they lost out because they couldn't carry enough. They were still expensive to operate. And eventually what happens is McLean sells them off to the government for conversion into fast sea lift ships. The eight ships are still in the reserve fleet today, even though they're almost 50 years old. He eventually sells off Sealand, but then acquires United States lines. And while at U.S. lines, he comes up with the opposite approach. I'm not going to build a fast vessel. I'm going to build a slow vessel, big, slow vessel, and establish a round-the-world service. And he does. He builds 12 what's called Econo ships, and he builds them in a very novel place, Korea at the Daewoo plant. And he builds the 12 Econo ships. They're big, 4,000 box vessels. These are the biggest ships at the time. They were seen as being too big, yet he builds the 12 Econo ships and puts them on a round the world service, basically going clockwise around the world. Uh, 12 of them all operating in this round the world service. The problem he has is that his service is too slow for some. There are other ships on there that are faster, quicker, and you have an upstart, foreign company in Taiwan by the name of Evergreen that doubles the number of ships and operates a twin round the world service, one going east, one going west. Their vessels are smaller but faster. And basically what you see is U.S. lines goes out of business in the 1980s. Now, the U.S. keeps up with technology, but one of the problems with the U.S. being so innovative is it adopts technologies that never bear fruition for them, which means they invest a lot of money in them and they don't do it. LNG, liquefied natural gas, today all the rage is liquefied natural gas. But the US under the Merchant Marine Act of 1970, a bill that was passed that aimed to re-kick shipbuilding. Uh, the old Merchant Marine Act of 1936 planned to build 500 ships in 10 years. The Merchant Marine Act of 1970 planned to build 300 ships in 10 years. Never succeeded in building the 300 ships, but more importantly, it didn't really kick off the restart of what was hoped to be the Merchant Marine. By 1970, most of the World War II fleet was aging out. It was 20 something years since then. New technologies were at place and a lot of the money spent in the Merchant Marine Act 1970 went into these new technologies. LNG was seen as this great new technology. Unfortunately, it wasn't exporting out of the United States. It was overseas. And the U.S., while it builds a LNG fleet, never finds fruition with it. Uh, large and ultra-large, very large and ultra-large crude carriers, the U.S. builds them. Matter of fact, we build one in the Manhattan, which is designed for operations in the Arctic through the Northwest Passage, very forward thinking at the time, but it becomes a one-off. And the U.S. cannot emphasize or really capitalize on the shipment of crude oil like it should, the seven sisters, the big companies of which five are American that un run tankers run themselves into problems. Amoco and Exxon in particularly have catastrophic losses of oil with the Amoco Cadiz and the Exxon Valdez. That means those tanker companies divest themselves of their tanker fleets. They move them offshore so that they won't be susceptible for uh, lawsuits should there be a, an issue. And we see the decline of them. We see the development of unique technologies, the sea barge there on the lower left, uh, operated by likes lines, and then the lash, the lighter aboard ships. These are basically large barges and, and lighters that are operated on board ships. Uh, the idea is, well, we'll take containers, but if containers are great, what about barges and these, these, these smaller barges on the last ship? 
they'll be equally as great. The problem you have is sea barges and last ships have to operate in very secluded waters. They can't be much waves, which means you need a good secure harbor. But the other problem is once you offload the barges, it takes a long time to off to, to unpack them, to unstuff them and to reload them, which necessitates buying a lot of these barges so that you can have at least three times the number you're carrying on the ship so that you can set up a service. And again, that's a huge infrastructure amount of money to buy in. And the U.S. just basically doesn't buy into that. And what we see is, as a result is the Merchant Marine Act of 1970 doesn't produce the results we need. Now, you would think that the U.S. Merchant Marine is declining in the 1970s, but the U.S. has to know that having a Merchant Marine is vital to its success as illuminated by World War I, World War II. And you get an example of that right in the middle of this. In the 1980s, the British fight the Falkland War. 1982, you have the Falkland War, this, this, this conflict that takes place. And one of the demonstrations that comes out of the Falkland War is the absolute essentialness of a merchant marine. The British have to take ships up from trade, stuffed ships taken up from trade. They outfit them for use as repair vessel, as you see with the diligence there in the lower right or the Atlantic conveyor on the lower left, outfitted as a auxiliary carrier and helicopter transport. You bring down ferries and tankers to replenish the vessels, and you even put ships into the middle of San Carlos waters as part of an amphibious assault vessels where you carry in the additional amphibious uh, or, or assault elements. Uh, even saw the use of the Queen Elizabeth II, the Canberra from P&O lines, a clear demonstration of how essential a merchant marine was. But unfortunately, the U.S. military's take from the Falklands was, well, this has never happened to us. We have carrier battle groups. We have the 82nd Airborne. We have long-range air power. We would never get into this. They didn't look at the sustainment and the logistics element of this. But you had an example of this in 1990, not just a few years later, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. You have the shipment of over half a million Americans into the desert of Saudi Arabia to liberate Kuwait. There are those X sl 7s outfitted as fast sea lift ships. You can see it right there. And one of the things that became very clear is that the military took the wrong lesson from the Persian Gulf War. They look at this chart on the upper left and they sit there and say, okay, about, you know, about a quarter of the cargo was carried by Commercial ships kept in the ready reserve fleet. These are government-owned ships that we can break out. So that's great. They saw as the orange and yellow there that you know we carried about maybe about 15, 20% in the pre-positioning of float fleet. So we carry them in that. We use the fast sea lift ships, the orange ones. We use the yellow and blue there. That's the pre-positioning. And then the purple was the foreign charters. About a quarter of the vessels came over were foreign charters. About 20% were U.S. charters, and then what was called SMEZA, the Special Midi Shipping Agreement. Those were also U.S. charters. Those were container ships. And we set up a, a seven U.S. companies to flow containers over there. The lesson the military took from this was, okay, the ready reserve fleet works great, prepositioning works great, and we need to increase those. They fail to look at the impact of the U.S. charters and, more importantly, SMEZA, which carried the sustainment cargo. They basically drew the wrong lesson, I would argue. And the reason I can say that is this, is shortly thereafter, two of the leading American shipping firms in the late 1980s into the 1990s all of a sudden, the U.S. firms are announcing they're going to leave. They're going to leave the U.S. registry, and they're going to go to a new registry that was created in the 1980s called the Marshall Islands. Now, Marshall Islands provided a lot of incentive for the Americans to go. Marshall Islands is a protectorate of the United States. So you get the protection of the United States, but you don't have the regulations of the United States. But the reason for this was kind of twofold. Number one, the United States had been investing in this pre-positioning and U.S. fleet. The U.S. had spent $13 billion to build and charter a fleet of five T-5 tankers and 13 maritime pre-positioning ships. After the war, they spent $6 billion building 20 large medium-speed roll-on, roll-off ships. Uh, 
But when Sealand and APL, American Presence Lines, announced that they were going to reflag, they're taking their ships out of the U.S. registry during the Bush administration, the first one. This is the response of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Procurement and Logistics, who, by the way, was later subsequently nominated to be Secretary of the Navy in the second Bush administration. The issue of the major U.S. flag container operators uh, dispensing of their U.S. flag fleets is primarily an economic rather than a national security issue. The, the DOD felt like this is an economic issue, not a national security issue. Whether we have a U.S. flag fleet is not important. What they missed was the absolute crucial element that the U.S. flag fleet provided. Yes, it provided that orange, that green slice right there where it brought over the sustainment cargo. Yes, it provided several ships to back up the reserve fleet as is in that red slice. But the crews for nearly all those vessels, except for the purple there, were provided from the active merchant marine. The maritime infrastructure to build and maintain those vessels came from the active merchant marine. And in many ways, the lessons out of the 80s and 90s were mistaken. Add to it in the 80s, we end the construction differential subsidies, the operational differential subsidies for ships engaged in the foreign trade. If you look back in the history of the United States in the 1950s and 60s, we build the interstate pipeline, interstate highway system that cuts the coastal fleet. We don't need tankers and cargo ships running from U.S. ports. We can do it on pipelines and on highways. When you create uh, transcontinental airline service with jets, the DC-8 and the um, um, Douglas uh, uh, DC-8, uh, uh, Boeing at 707. Now, all of a sudden, you free up rail space for more cargo. All of a sudden, you're seeing a precipitous decline now in the U.S. international trading fleet and the U.S. coastal fleet. And what that translates into is this graph right here which shows you the decline of the fleet. Let me remove myself here so you can see this a little better. So you can see the peak here in Korea where the US fleet is about 1,242 ships. By the time you get to Vietnam, the peak there is about 948 ships. You come out of Vietnam, you're down to 587 ships. You come into the beginning of the 1980s where you start ending the construction and operational differential subsidies. And what you see is just a continually decline of the U.S. Merchant Marine. The latest numbers of the U.S. Merchant Marine, this is from the Maritime Administration, as of October of 2021, 180 ships, 7.36 million gross tons. And when you look at that fleet, that fleet is made up in a series of, of, of uh, operating companies, less than 30 operating companies. The large majority of them, the ones in, in red there, are operated in the coastal protected trade, the Jones Act trade. Uh, 60 of them are receiving a subsidy that was created in the 1990s called the Maritime Security Program, where they receive an operating subsidy to operate. And then the other vessels that you'll see there are operated in fairly unique trades or under government charter and therefore can operate within it, but down to 180 vessels. Remember, go back 1,242 at the peak there uh, back in uh, roughly around 1951, 1952 that we see happening. This impact isn't just in the number of ships and the number of merchant mariners we have. One of the things we see here, and this is from shipbuildinghistory.com, shows you the decline in shipyards. This only goes up to 2016, but it's still fairly accurate. It shows you the decline of shipyards, the maritime infrastructure of the United States, where <coughs> me, in the early 1950s, you had a slew of shipyards along the Atlantic coast, Atlantic coast, including such powerhouses as Beth Steele, uh, New York uh, uh, shipbuilding, uh, 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 Sun shipbuilding, uh, you name it, Beth Steele at Sparrows Point. I mean, just massive shipyards that were instrumental in our success in World War II, for example. Now we're just down to Bath Irons, uh, which basically builds naval vessels, largely destroyers, uh, 
electric boat, which is solely building right now, Navy submarines. What had been the Philadelphia Navy shipyard now is Acre Philly. Now it's just the Philly shipyard. They're building the new national uh, uh, security multi-mission vessels, the five training ships for the state maritime academies. And then Newport News Shipbuilding, which is basically just building aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines. Go down here to the Gulf Coast, uh, where we had, for example, Alabama dry dock and shipbuilding, Ingalls, Avondale, batch of yards. Right now, you know, Avondale is gone. Uh, it's no longer building ships. Uh, you still have Mobile Shipyard right now. That's still in existence right now. And you would add also to uh, uh, that the establishment of Austell, which is building littoral combat ships and fast transports. And then Ingalls, which is still building Navy amphibs, the large deck amphibs and the uh, Coast Guard uh, national security cutters. On the Pacific Coast, you went from a series of yards down to just NASCO which is building uh, ships for auxiliary vessels for the military sea lift command for the Navy and with hopes to build more. And then on the Great Lakes, just Bay shipping along with Fincantieri, which is building littoral combat ships. So a significant reduction in our shipbuilding infrastructure. Again, you had an assistant secretary of defense who in 1992 is talking about the reflagging of ships and the decline of, of the maritime base and is not looking at the impact that's going to have on the industrial base. If you look at the size of the U.S. Merchant Marine, this comes from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. This is their data, and I, I, I uh, magnified it right here. If you look at 1960, the World Fleet had, and these are ships over 1,000 gross tons, had over 17,000 ships. The U.S. Fleet was 2,926 ships. We were at 16.9%. By 1970, we were down to 7.9%. By 1980, down to 3.5%. 1990, 2.7%. By 2000, down to 1,000%. By 2010, we're at 0.6%. And the last number they have on here, which is the 2019 number, I think, or 2019, which should be about what 2020 is at, is 0.4%. Look at the growth of the world fleet there. Get my face off here so you can see it a little better. The world fleet in the meantime has doubled while the US fleet has gone from, again, a massive number down to just a handful. They show 182 there. We were at 2,926. The world fleet was at 17,000 vessels. And now we're talking about over 43,000 vessels. So a, a, just a, a massive drop for the U.S. Merchant Marine. So I nowhere near covered all the details. I skimmed over stuff and I'm sure people are going to put it in the comments and please do let's make a discussion out of it whatever i left off please let me know but this is one of the things i wanted to show was how the merchant marine has undergo undergone this decline we're seeing it kind of really fall and it's one of the reasons why last week you saw the announcement for a new registry the u.s virgin islands which unlike the marshall island registry is a U.S. territory. It's, it's, it's part of the United States. The Marshall Islands is a protectorate commonwealth under a, uh, a, a treaty of protection. I would much rather see incentives to get the U.S. merchant marine going. But again, I started sailing in 1989. And the only thing I've ever seen in my career is the merchant marine decline. Really, you know, there's been a little hiccups here and there where it may go up a ship or two here or there, but but largely it's, it's in decline. Meanwhile, world trade is is doubling, you know, every 10 years or so. You know, again, 1950, we hauled half a billion tons of cargo on the world oceans. 2021, probably about 12 billion tons. So again, the lack of a merchant marine has an impact, has an impact on our economy as we're seeing with congestion and, and, and the inability to export our goods from ports. It puts us at a disadvantage when we want to export goods like LNG over to Europe and deal with countries like Russia and China. It is an element of our soft power. It hurts our Navy because shipbuilding is at a premium now. We're building very few ships, which means that they tend to be more expensive. Uh, 
Go to China, which builds 40% of the world's ships. They're building their latest warships right along commercial ships, right alongside. And that allows them to use, you know, economy of scale. And we need to either invest in this, come up with a plan and strategy. The reason I hopped on the proposed administrator for the Maritime Administration was I thought she did not seem to have any plan or insight into how we fix this decline. The U.S. maritime unions came out in force against the Virgin Island Registry, which is great. It's always good to see the maritime unions come together. But the only times they ever come together is when they think there's a threat to them. They need to come together on a consistent basis. Where are they with a policy to get the maritime industry going? And there needs to be a unified voice. And there needs to be a unified voice from labor, from shipbuilding, there were efforts, understand there were efforts to change laws, there was efforts to minimize the amount of subsidies internationally that could be done that was undone at times. There's a lot going on here. Uh, a lot of the material I came from was referenced from a book entitled Abandoned Ocean. Uh, it is a dated book, I would argue. I use this book in my class in it. Uh, my problem with this is it ends in 1999 and the two people who write it were very involved in the the 70s and 80s and 90s position. And you can see their slant in it. Uh, I don't think it's a very well-rounded uh, book when it comes to that section in particular. And I hope to update that in some time in the future. So there's my view on the decline of the US merchant marine. Does this mean it's gone? It's, it, it's right it off as it, dead as the Roman empire? No, but it's in decline. And for it to come back, we'll need a concentrated effort. It will need the support of the public, the military, the government, when the DOD sits there and says, we don't need a merchant marine, we can get by with foreign registries and we can allow vessels to go, they are undoing a relationship that has existed from the day that the Navy in the United States was created when the delegates from the Continental Congress walked down to the docks in Philadelphia and literally bought a handful of ships to create the US Navy and took their merchant crews and brought them into the Navy. John Paul Jones was a merchant sailor who's made the first lieutenant on the Alfred. And so that spirit should be in our minds when we think about the merchant marine today. Vital for our national economy, vital for our national defense. The motto of the merchant marine is in peace and war. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe. Hit the bell so you be alerted about new videos when they come out. Be sure to leave a comment. Add to the discussion. If I left something out, you want me to go in more detail, happy to do it, please do. And if you can, if you can, please contribute to the Patreon page. That allows me to get new cameras like this. I've actually got a new monitor too, actually a couple of monitors now, so I can actually do a lot. One of the reasons is that the video may not be the best is I was still learning the system. So until our next video, the Sal, I'm signing off.